Um, <coughs> clean up hitter and final talk of the day. Just before we get started on that, I'll just put in a couple more plugs. Um, if you don't follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, please seek us out and find us. Um, you can get links to all our accounts at uh, rochesterbaseballhistory.org. Um, if you have not been getting emails from me personally about events, there is a sheet of paper on the back table. If you leave your email address, I'll be sure to add you to our list and make sure you're notified of uh, future events. Right, so for our last speaker today, we have uh, Jim Goldstein uh, from He's an associate professor of accounting at Canisius College in Buffalo. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about um, understanding revenue per win across different baseball markets. Uh, this was uh, uh, originally presented at the National Sabre Convention this summer in New York City. And uh, please have him here. Thanks. <laughs> so I am an accountant. So to quote the uh, Field of Dreams movie, when I saw that presentation, I was like, is this happening? <laughs> so I actually, uh, that was right up my, my alley, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm from the Nations the, uh, College. Uh, this is not just my work. I actually work with a gentleman by the name of Paul Sauer. And we've done a lot of work together on different topics in the business world. And a couple years ago, I said, why don't we do something fun for a change? We're both sports fans. So uh, baseball is full of data. Why don't we take a look at that and see what it can tell us from a, from a business perspective? So uh, there's been a lot of changes since was, uh, this was presented in New York in July. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to understand uh, how baseball teams, how revenue relates to on-field performance. There hasn't been a lot of talk about this out there in the academic literature. There are some things going on in different blogs on the internet, although sometimes they'll tell us numbers, but they won't really say how they got the numbers. Like I saw one article, for example, where it was generally accepted that a win cost about $5 million. But there wasn't really an ex any explanation as to why that came about. Somebody looked at the free agent market and said, how much does it cost to actually win a game? There's not much out there about how much a team actually makes per win. And we expect this to vary depending on the market that you're in. Obviously, not all teams are considered equal. So uh, we took a look at revenue per win in four baseball markets. And we based those baseball markets on demographics. In other words, the populations of the areas where those teams reside. Okay, so that's one way we can look at that. We did that because we did expect differences, but we always also did that because uh, there's not much data out there. We only have 26 years worth of data to work, look at, so some of the larger teams and some of the larger markets don't have any teams in there representing them. I'll show you what that looks like. So the reason we're doing this, we're saying this can add a lot of value in how people decide what are players worth. Okay? There's a very popular statistic out there that's been popular for about 10 years, I would say. It's called WAR. Some of you are probably familiar with that, wins above replacement. How much does a player actually contribute to a team's winning record over that of a replacement player? In other words, someone coming up from AAA. So if we can understand how much money a team made per game or per win, we could have better insight of how much that player is worth just looking at the war side. So that was one reason why we thought this was interesting. The other reason was, how should teams brand themselves? Sounds strange to talk about competitive sports teams and say, should we focus on winning or should we focus on something else? But how, much, how strong is that link between winning and how much money I'm making? So interestingly enough, um, when you look at how a team makes money and how this is changing, yeah, these colors are kind of interesting, aren't they? They look better on my screen. But um, I was going to call them something else. But I can see like the black there, uh, actually, I'm looking at gate receipts, which is 28% in 2010 and 23% in 2014. Then the blue is premium seating. Then I got concession and parking. If you take a look at these, the percentage representation of attendance-related revenue is really falling. And that's because the market's changing, right? I mean, like, people don't have to go to games to get money over to baseball teams. We have online streaming services. It doesn't matter where you live anymore. So this continues to fall. The reason why I have this up here is because when we started looking at this, one of the things you do in an academic study is you start to look at what's been done in the past. And most studies in the past have looked at how do attendance-related revenues react to factors in the environment. That's most, where most of the work has been done. But if that percentage is falling, that old work isn't as relevant today. So the market has changed. We want to understand this a little bit better. So there's been some work in this field. If you guys haven't seen these books, they're pretty interesting reads. Right? One's by Vince Gennaro, who, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he's like the Sabre president right now, Vince Gennaro. 
That's called Diamond Dollars. And there's another one that predates that by Nate Silver called Baseball Between the Numbers. That was like 2007, 2011. What these guys did was they said, you know, we can look at revenue per win, but not every win is created equal when it comes to making money, right? Uh, a team that's winning games just to reach 500, that, those games aren't worth as much to the bottom line as a team that's trying to go for the postseason. So when they looked at this, they looked at each individual game and said, how much money does each individual game add in revenue to the team? Well, they ended up with these S-shaped curves because the idea is the games, again, going for 500 don't make as much money, that as you approach the postseason, those games are worth a lot more to the club. Then as the postseason is solidified, and I already know I'm in the postseason, I'm not making as much money. So it's kind of like an S-shaped curve here. And there's an example up there of the New York Yankees versus the Atlanta Braves. Yankees are the solid line, and this is from Gennaro's book. And he's saying, look, the Yankees fans, I know this because I'm a Yankee fan, right? They have high expectations. So you better win to make money. Right? The Atlanta Braves, so each team has a little bit of different look as far as their, what he calls a win curve. Now, this is a great concept. This makes a lot of sense. But we decided not to do the same thing. What we went through is we decided to make every, every uh, win created equal for how much revenue. So we're looking at average numbers. The reason why we're doing that is, remember, we're looking at player valuation. So if I've got Mike Trout, he's got a 6.7 war. That means he adds 6.7 wins to the Angels over a replacement player. Which 6.7 games? Which 6.7 wins? Could I figure that out? I could probably try. But the idea is these, these win curves work very well for what Gennaro and Silver were doing. But for our purposes, we're going to look at all wins equally. Okay? We're going to look at average revenue per win. So when I was at the Sabre conference, i got to admit, I, I did this on purpose. I put Vince Gennaro's name all over the abstract so he would show up, and he did. And of course, he raised the, the point that like, you, know, you can't look at all wins equally. But I understand that. For purposes of what we're doing, it makes more sense to do it this way. So. Um, so that's the first point up there. Now, where do we get these numbers from? Now, you just saw a presentation on the Red Wings, right? Major League Baseball teams don't have to disclose financials. So this information is not readily available. But there's a gentleman by the name of, uh, I'm going to mess this up, Mike Azanian, I think is the way you pronounce this. He's been producing estimates since 1990 on Major League Baseball team values and also revenues. And in Financial World was the name of the magazine from 90 to 96 where these things were published. Financial World is gone. But perhaps you've seen the Business of Baseball reports from Forbes every single year. They come out on the web. Um, so I've got about 26 years worth, because I've, I've just gone to 2015. I haven't gone to 2016 or 2017. Um, and Doug Pappas, the late Doug Pappas of the Business of Baseball Committee of Sabre, right, he actually has these numbers listed on his website. So I take that as an endorsement. I've also done some research, and people have said these are pretty solid. They're close to what they should be. So we decided to rely on those. Besides, there's no other figures out there. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know if this is good or bad, and you're the first person to do something. It either means you did it wrong, or it doesn't make sense, or maybe you really are stumbling on something. That's usually not the case. But nobody else seems to have used these numbers before, so I find it pretty interesting. Uh, but we took these numbers, took revenue numbers for each team per year, and we uh, made sure that we deflated them properly to take out inflation because we wanted to remove that effect so we could look at uniformity. And then again, we based our teams in four markets based on the size of the cities that they're located in. And we looked at two time periods. I call them pre-revenue sharing and revenue sharing. Um, I know there was some revenue sharing prior to 1996, but the main uh, first comprehensive revenue sharing program really started in 96. So we broke our, our periods into two periods. We want to see if, if these varied not by market, but also by time period. So 1995, you're only looking at sharing of some gate receipts and some local cable tel television revenue. That's it. All right. So was there a difference? So this is really hard to read. But I'm trying to give a sense as to on the left-hand side, you got 90 to 95. On the right-hand side, you got 96 to 15. And like this is what we call our mega market teams. Mega market teams, let me just make sure I got the right numbers here. Mega market teams, you got a population of over 10 million people living in that area. So we got Los Angeles Dodgers, the Angels, the Mets, and the Yankees in this, in this market. We're calling that mega market. And now you can see just like growth in revenues after being deflated for inflation in, in the sport. The sport has grown tremendously. I think we all know what this big bar is here, right? You should have pinstripes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I've only got four teams in this market. That is a limitation. That is a limitation. 
Um, then we've got what we call, we, we name this the large market. This is five to 10 million people. I'm not gonna read all these, but some of the examples are the Washington Nationals, the Philadelphia Phillies, the Oakland Athletics. Okay, so those are, that's, you can see again growth. I've got 10 teams in this bucket. <coughs> Um, the reason why in the medium market, the pre-revenue and the post-revenue don't match is because of expansion teams. We've included everybody that existed during this 26 year period, regardless if they existed the whole time or if they didn't, right? So we call this medium market, and medium market is three to five billion people in that region. Um, examples, Toronto Blue Jays, the good old Montreal Expos, um, may they rest in peace, the Houston Astros. I did put this presentation together during Game 7 with John TV. It's a pretty awesome way to celebrate Game 7. Um, and then, small market. 10 and 9 and these, I got like the Tampa Bay Rays, the Padres, the Pirates, et cetera. So these are the different uh, markets we're looking at. Again, we're interested, revenue per win, does it differ based on what market we're talking about? Because that's gonna have huge implications for player value. Now, um, I don't know how many people remember like uh, high school algebra and statistics, stuff like that, but uh, we, I'm gonna try to do this as simply as possible. Uh, uh, Paul, who I work with, he's the genius with the statistics, it's great. I tell him I wanna run something, he runs off and does it. Um, but we're gonna be using a simple technique called ordinary least squares regression. Regression says, I've got two variables. I'm trying to decide how they relate to each other. Does one variable explain the other? So that's what we're doing, right? We're looking at, rep, does the wins explain the amount of revenue I'm making? So um, my uh, middle daughter was doing um, high school, not high school, middle school math, and she was like, this stuff is pointless. What am I gonna use this for? So I did this for her, because she's doing this y, this y equals mx plus b stuff. This is what she's doing right now, so I put this in here for Emily. But m is my slope, that's how much it goes up and down, right? B is like, you know, if I, it's my intercept, right? If there's a zero value on X, that's the answer. So if I'm already losing you, the idea is I can plot uh, wins on the bottom axis, revenue on the top, and just put all the dots in. And I try to fit a line. If there's a relationship, I can fit a line, right? That's what regression does, forces a line in there. And the idea is that line fits as best as possible. So you got all these little points, and you got distance to that fitted line. I want to make that as close as possible. If it's really close, that means it's a good relationship. What I'm trying to do, I've accomplished. So putting it in statistical terminology, I'm saying the amount of revenue I make is equal to some value even if I won no games. I don't think there's ever been a major league team. Maybe the Mets came close at one point. They won zero games. Yeah. Oh, I'm <laughs> we're, we're, we're mega market brothers. We get along. Okay, so if I won zero games, I'd make this beta zero, right? But, it, but then there's a point where it's like, I, I won a game. How much do I make per game? I'm trying to figure out what beta is. So that's my statistics. It's like, you know, it's not as complicated as it looks. Um, but now I'm going to throw some numbers up here. And I'm going to try to make this really simple. I'm interested in knowing how much you make every time you win a game, right? So there's a lot of numbers up here. So I got my markets going down on the left-hand side. I've also got my time periods for each of those markets. And if I look at that, there's that beta, that B. If I, if I focus on that, I can say, for example, which I had a pointer. Um, I, oh, here we go. I can say like mega market teams, they made $752,000 on average every time they won a game in 90 to 95. But holy cow, look what happened. In 96 to 2015, they made $2.1 million per game. That's what the formula, now is this correct? This is what the line is saying. How well does it fit? That's another situation, right? Um, and then, you know, if you go all the way down to the small market teams, they're making $800,000 every time they win a game. They have been making $470,000. So it gives us some degree of a sense of how much you're making. The reason why um, the medium, oh it's not, it's not, but the medium market wins for 96 to 15 should be a red. Uh, in statistical language it means it's not significant, there's no relationship. Every other time period, every other market, there's a strong relationship between the number of wins I have and the amount of money I make. I don't think that's really surprising, right? It's not also surprising that the large, the mega market teams make so much money per win and the smaller ones don't. That's not surprising either. So there is a relationship. Okay, 
And there's only one other piece of statistics we need to understand this stuff. That was the first piece. The second piece is how well does that line fit that I showed you guys? If it fits really well, that means I'm really dependent on wins to make money. Now here's what the interesting thing is. Now R square is the way I measure that. And the highest it can go is 100%. If it's 100%, there's a direct relationship. Every time I make, uh, I win a game, I'm definitely gonna make money. Right, so how well does it fit? So, make, so if we look at these numbers, here's how I can explain this. Large market teams, before revenue sharing, there was a 38% reliance on the amount of wins I'm making to make money. That's pretty sizable. There's a pretty strong relationship. Same with medium, 28%. Small, 38%. Mega, not so much. So what does this mean? That means that what it would happen is if the uh, Yankees went into a tailspin on the field, they would suffer less financially than a small market team. Small market teams are very reliant on wins. Now here's the interesting takeaway that we found, that we found pretty interesting. You see that change in R-square? Big changes. After revenue sharing is introduced, teams aren't so dependent on winning anymore. In fact, if you look at um, large market teams, they're only 4.7% reliant on that. So it's almost like we've unattached the team performance on the field from how much money I'm making. Seems kind of weird, counterintuitive, right? What that might mean is that revenue sharing is doing well. It reversed that relationship. So if you're a small market team and you go into a tailspin, you're not in a spiral because it's not that you keep losing games, you keep losing money. So you can't hire people to keep winning games. You keep losing. Maybe this has something to do with competitive balance. But definitely other factors are more important now to make money for Major League Baseball teams. Very interesting. Now, um, just to, and this kind of highlights that, right? The blue bar, um, and I guess that's kind of a sickly green now, but the blue bar uh, will show you how dependent these markets were on winning games before revenue sharing kicked in. And then the, the sickly green bar says, here's where we are today. Again, a big reduction on the reliance of wins to make money. So it's, I, I find that interesting that that happened. Um, I call this darn Yankees, because um, I, I put all the teams together, how much money they're making, and the Yankees are definitely an outlier, right? They're making an average of $201.3 million a year uh, in, in the post-revenue sharing, in the, in the revenue sharing era. The closest team are the uh, Boston Red Sox with like 144 million, that's a huge gap. So one of the other things we did, just to be certain that we're not looking at some kind of strange numbers, is we also ran this analysis and pulled the Yankees right out. Now the problem with that is that only leaves me with three mega market teams. Statistically, that kind of gets a little weird. Without going through all the numbers, the main findings we found are still the same. It still holds true. So these are the four main things we found. All four markets show a significant relationship between wins and revenue in the pre-revenue sharing time period. That means wins are very important pre-revenue sharing. You win games, you make money. However, mega market teams, not surprising, earn more revenue per win than smaller market teams in both periods. We're not shocked by that. But the weird finding is that all four markets show less dependence on wins to generate revenue today than they did in the past. So we're, we're almost at the point where you could say it doesn't matter as much. Now as fans, that sounds, again, doesn't sound right. But other revenue streams have popped up in today's game. So I want to do this kind of like, do an application here. I got Mike Trout up here, okay? Uh, Mike Trout had a 6.7 win above replacement value uh, in 2017. So with Mike Trout on the team, that means that, you know, the Angels are going to win 6.7 more games than they would have if he wasn't playing. Like a AAA guy came up and played for him. Uh, his amount of money they paid him above the league minimum of 535000 I'd love to get $535,000 minimum. <laughs> Even if he rode the bench, he made 535,000 bucks. They paid him 19 and a half million over that. So I think that you can look at the cost real simply, right? If Mike Trout contributed 6.7 games, and he, they paid him 19 and a half million for that, then they, co they cost him about 3 million bucks for each of those wins. Simple math, right? 19 and a half divided by 6.7. That's the easy part, but what about the amount of money that Mike made the Angels? That's the part that we haven't answered yet. You can use some of our results here to look at this. So if all I did was take those betas I showed you guys and multiply them against his, his wins. And you know, whether we agree with this or not, that means that, you know, here's the weird thing. The media market, no relationship. Media market teams show 
No, it doesn't matter how many games you win, how, many money, how much money you make. Very strange. But for the other markets, the Angels would have made 7.3 million just because Mike Trout helped win those games. So here's my question, and then it changes per market because what I find really strange also is small market teams make more money per win than large. That's interesting. So did we pay overpay Mike Trout? Because we're only making 7.3, we gave him 19.5. Are they a bunch of suckers over there in Los Angeles? Yeah, probably, but for other reasons, right? <laughs> no, you can't look at that. You gotta look at how reliant are the teams on wins? These numbers are really small. Remember I said the highest you go is 100%? So that must mean the Trout's adding value in different ways than just winning games. So we're in a new, whole new ball game, right? Whole new, I almost just said that without you know, thinking, right? So that brings us to the questions. We have to know what factors are important for teams to make money today because it's not really wins as much as it had been in the past. And there's going to be different factors. There's going to be player-dependent factors, like star value. Mike Trout plays for the Angels. Maybe people come to the game just because Mike Trout's there. I know that I've been, you know, a friend contacted me and said, hey, Mike Trout's going to be in Cleveland. Let's go because Mike Trout's there. So is that how Mike Trout contributes? Also, if I buy a Mike Trout jersey, it has nothing to do with wins, right? So there's different ways that Mike Trout actually contributes. So star value is an example. If there are any player-dependent factors, Trout should be compensated for those. There's also non-player dependence, like a new stadium, right? Uh, or some other factors that might exist. So we need to discover what these are. They might even be market specific. So this is kind of like the first core way to say, you need to find out what these things are in order to figure out how to manage these teams. And then the second point is, I mentioned branding before. Should teams focus on fielding a winning team or other things they should focus on? This is always the big balance between business and competitiveness. What do owners focus on? Some, Owners are accused of not spending enough on their team to, to field a winning team, but they also have to make money, right? And that's a strange question, but there is a book out there that I found about 10 years ago called The Elusive Fan. And, and, and the idea is that you don't focus on uh, winning, you focus on other factors because winning's uncontrollable. So it's saying, like, how do you market your team? So a lot of questions out there, I think this analysis raised more questions than it actually answered. So the next things we're going to be looking at is what are those determinants? Right? The other thing I think is really interesting, I read a blog posting, there's a lot of cool stuff out there in these blogs. You can't really keep up with all of them, like Hardball Times and you know, Beyond the Box Bar, et cetera. But there's this one person who challenged the idea of like, what's a market? There's, and he said, there's no such thing as a small market team. In other words, you can spend as much as you want in your market because you're not confined by your geographical area anymore. So if a team's whining about being a small market team, it's saying you don't have to be anymore. And I thought that was really interesting. So I want to explore that, too. Um, it's kind of cool, too. If I forced to do research, why not do something like baseball? Um, so that, that's, that's the presentation. So any questions, I'll, I'll take those. Yeah? Well, just anecdotally, I know from going to minor league games, when one of the major league players is sent down and they're on the field that day, the attendance goes to yep. the roof. So I don't know if you'd be able to use any of that. Remember when Steven Strasburg pitched in Buffalo a number of years ago because he was injured, everybody went to the game, as soon as Strasburg was pulled out, everyone left. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. 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 When he appeared here. Yeah. He came to Rob's ship, the attendance was way up. And we had Bautista also in uh, yeah. Buffalo, and yeah. you know, big reaction. Exactly, star power is a big deal. It's a death war. <laughs> There's more of an impact at the minor level than it would be at the major level just because of attendance ratios. It could be, it could be. Um, although I do know that, like, you know, me personally, I'll even say, like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Tanaka's pitching, I want to go see that game. Or, like, uh, uh, Patances, you know, was injured, I'm, I'm not sure if they're going to use him. Heck, I went to Mariano Rivera's last game because it was his last game and the place was sold out. So I think it kind of fits in both places. I mean, there was also an interesting article about the Oakland Athletics during the Moneyball era, how Bean used his unconventional methods to hire young and experienced players, and they made less money because people weren't excited about these big, there were no big names to go cheer on. So that, it was kind of like the flip side. So I, I, the thing is, with baseball and money, I don't think you're ever going to completely understand there's going to be noise in there. You're never going to completely say, just like you can't load it into a computer and win a World Series. You know, 
How did that happen? But um, anything else? All right. Thanks.